A History of the Amhara and Ethiopia, a revision of unpopular truths and incidents of history. According to Ethiopian history and classics such as the Abyssinians by David Buxton, a Cambridge University researcher who traveled to Ethiopia during World War II, the Amhara are an ancient Ethiosemitic people who are settled agriculturalists of the Ethiopian plateau, living mainly in the highland regions but also throughout the nation. On page 27 of the Abyssinians, David Buxton relates that the Amhara along with the other Abyssinians, are the ones who share the traditions of the Aksum Kingdom. The Amhara have inhabited the plateau conventionally for 3,000 years. Amharic, the language of the Amhara, is the official language of Ethiopia. Amharic became the official language of the Old Ethiopian Empire in the 13th century when Yukunno Amlak became emperor in 1270 AD and moved the capital to Tuglat and Shoah in today's alleged Amhara and Oromia region which then was inhabited by the Amhara as stated on the New International Encyclopedia, Volume 7, page 248. Aksum remained the city where the kings were crowned at the time and Ge'ez remained the language of books and of the church. Amharic is a South Semitic language either descended from Ge'ez or related to Ge'ez, as well as to the Ethiosemitic languages, Arabic, Hebrew and Aramaic. But according to Wolf Leslow, the late professor emeritus at UCLA, a scholar of Semitic languages and one of the foremost authorities on the study, and Dr. Girma Demeka, among the most closely related languages to Amharic and Ge'ez is Akkadian, an ancient Near Eastern language which was spoken in Mesopotamia in modern day Iraq and Syria 5,000 years ago. This points to the little understood, mysterious and ancient history of the Amhara and related people. The predominant religion of the Amhara is Orthodox Christianity, the state religion of Aksum, but Islam and Judaism are also practiced by the Amhara. Prior to the introduction of Orthodox Christianity from the 1st to the 4th centuries AD and Aksum was declared a Christian state by Emperor Ezana, the ancient Hebraic faith that developed into Judaism was practiced by the Amhara and other Aksumites of Ethiopia for conventionally a thousand years, since the time of King Solomon and the Queen of Sheba whose descendants the Amhara rulers are according to oral and written tradition. An Islamic dynasty that founded its own kingdom based on the claim of descent from the Muslim prophet Muhammad or one of his family members had also thrived in Ifa and Shoah following the disintegration of the Aksum Empire as Muslims sought refuge in the Christian Empire due to persecution by the Quraysh in Arabia in the 7th century at the birth of Islam. After the 10th century fall of the Aksumite Empire, which was said to be among the four greatest empires of the globe in its heyday, including Persia, China and Rome, by influential and renowned philosophers such as Manichaeus, the three and a half hundred year ascendancy of the Zagwe dynasty of the Ago, a people related to the Amhara, took place. The Ago rulers are known for their particular piety and their remarkable monuments of an underground city entirely hewn out of solid rock. St. George at Lalibela is the most famous example of these remarkable geometric shadow for which King and St. Lalibela is credited. At the fall of Aksum, the last surviving rulers of the fallen empire are said to have fled from the northern Aksum city southward to Shoah. The 13th century emperor Yukunno Amlak, who claimed descent from the last ruler of Aksum, was enthroned in the attempt of restoring the previous paternal line of rulers. Yukunno Amlak and his successors became to be known as the Amhara emperors of Ethiopia. Amhara became the geographical and political center of the Orthodox Christian Empire under Yukuno Amlak. With the Amhara king's ascendancy came what is known as the Golden Era of Ethiopic or Ge'ez literature. 
in the 13th and 14th centuries through the 16th century. Albert Gerard's African language literatures on page 8 reads that 1270, when Yukuno Amlak mounted the throne, is when the golden age of Ge'ez literature began. Remarkable and almost surreal constructions, like those of the Zagwe's rock-hewn monuments, also took place during the reign of Yukuno Amlak's successors. For instance, as recorded in the Futuhal Habesha, which was an account of the 16th century war between the Christian Empire of Ethiopia and forces backing the Adol Sultanate, Emperor Naod had built a church or temple known as Makana Salasi, made entirely of gold that was looted and burned down by the invading forces. The source relates that it had taken him 13 years to build it, and that upon dying his son Libna Dingil had continued its construction. The passage in the Futu al Habesha on pages 220 and 221 and then 240 through 247 reads, There was a church in Amahara that had no peer in Abyssinia. King Naod, the father of King Wenaksegga, at a Libna Dingil's crown name that is, had built it. He exhausted himself in its construction, in its planning, and in every detail of the work. He adorned it with gold and spent 13 years in its construction. His son took over its construction after him. It was entirely plated in gold leaf. It blazed like a fire. The king named it Makana Selassie. The sepulchre of King Naod, bin Admas, bin Zerayakov is inside the church. Amhara has other churches in it that belong to earlier kings but a construction like this church was not to be found. The recollection of their journey to Amhara, which is a region of flat arable land standing crops, rivers and copious rain of wheat and barley. In it are their scribes, their priests and monks. It is also the residence of their kings, but the king does not reside there permanently. No king who reigns over Abyssinia can exercise his rule unless he has been enthroned in Amhara. They call the people there who serve the church as Deptara, which means in their language eloquent theologians. These are Christian people whom the king regards with beneficence and diffidence. Some of them become advisors to the king while others are related to him by marriage. The Imam asked all the Arabs who were with him, Is there the like of this church with its images and its gold in Byzantium or in India or in any other place? They replied, we never saw or heard of its like in Byzantium or India or anywhere in the world. As said in Jean Dorès's Ethiopia on page 145, the plunderers also looted a book made of gold, and the royal insignia and treasure concealed at Gannatamariam, as well as crowns, diadems of ancient kings, ceremonial mantles and daggers. They also found a number of tabots, altar tables representing the Ark of the Covenant, made of gold and that were so heavy that five men together were unable to carry them. Libna Dingil was never to see the help which the Portuguese had helped to carry out. He who twenty years before rode forth on horseback, crowned and with an escort of chained lions, died a year before their arrival with hardly an attendant. The Al Ibrahimi Yemeni chronicler of the Futuh al Habesha during the 16th century war between the Ethiopian Empire and the forces backing Grand Ahmed records that the invading forces needed 20 days to loot and recuperate all the gold from one single church in Amhara. This somewhat reveals the massive degree of the empire's wealth at the time prior to the irredeemable and severe damage brought upon it and the endless war between invaders and the emperor striving to save it from total destruction to prevent its conquest. The concealment of these truths has led to the dishonest portrayal of the Ethiopian emperors and particularly the Amhara as an oppressive people because the emperors and the people fought off invaders and did not hesitate to destroy their killers. This utterly destructive war occurred in the beginning of the 16th century after Libna Dingil succeeded his father Emperor Naod. During his reign, the great capital city of Ethiopia was Barara, 
displayed on Fra Moro's map and supported by recent archaeological findings. The capital city, Barara, was located near and on the same soil as the modern capital, Addis Ababa, which astonishingly explains Emperor Minilik's ambition to retrieve and recover the land of his ancestors and situate the new capital, Addis Ababa, where the capital of the kingdom was prior to the 16th century Oromo migration. Barara was the capital of Ethiopia between 1435 and 1530. The city was destroyed and occupied by the Oromo, whereas before it was the siege of the emperor of Ethiopia, where he concentrated wealth and power. Emperor Zereagob held power at Barara, sending for artisans in India and Venice. Emperor Zerayakob's envoys were welcomed with full honor at a great church conciliar meeting in Florence in 1440, leading to his recognition as the legendary Prester John. It was during the reign of Libna Dingil that two major and catastrophic events that will happen simultaneously and which will indefinitely change the fate of the Amhara and of the entire nation occur. The Oromo migration and expansion, which will bring immense chaos and bloodshed, contributing to the peril of a significant portion of the population, namely of the Amhara and related people, such as the Gafat people who are now extinct, and the war with Grang Ahmed's invading forces. In the Abyssinians, on page 57, the Cambridge researcher Buxton, consistently with every credible sources on the matter concerning the history of Ethiopia and the Amhara, states, the bleak Addis Ababan region, along with the even higher and colder district of Menz, further north, belongs to the historic heart of Old Shoah. Many names famous in Ethiopian history since the 13th century are associated with it, and Zara Yaakob made his headquarters for a time at Debra Brahan. Oromo tribes invaded the plateau in the 16th century, pushing the Amhara into the gorges in the broken country to the east, and it was the main concern of the Shoan princes of the 18th and early 19th centuries to regain control of the plateau. The author adds, the hardy Amhara who make their living from the windswept plateau from, or from the rather cozier recesses of the gorges are a proud and highly individualistic people. On page 28, he relates that the deeply entrenched and almost impassable valley of the Abai or Blue Nile where it forms the southern boundary of Gojam is one of the more clearly defined ethnic boundaries in Ethiopia. South of the river, the population is solidly Oromo, except to the west where Negroid tribes who have pushed in from the White Nile occupy most of the lower country. The Oromo people were absent from Ethiopian territory in medieval times before the 16th century, though their ancestors must have been multiplying in what is now Somali country south of the Gulf of Aden, with their highly developed tribal organization characteristic institutions outgrew their living space and started migrating in a southwesterly direction towards the end of the 15th century. In the 16th century, taking advantage of the universal chaos following the Muslim wars, the war with Grang Ahmed's forces, the Oromos flooded into the southern marches of Ethiopia. As a result of this wholesale immigration, and in spite of the ferocious resistance of various Ethiopian monarchs, the Oromo came to occupy a great part of the plateau as far north as Walegga, Shoa, and the region of Harar. They also occupied with less difficulty large tracts of the intermediate levels, as for instance the escarpment region of Wallo, where they form a buffer community between the Amhara of the highlands and the Danakil of the desert. As Buxton and other authorities, both local and international, relate, the migration and expansion of the Oromo resulted in the genocide of a significant and massive number of the Amhara population and other indigenous people inhabiting the southern region. In Abba Bahari's chronic chronicles known as Zena Hulagala, which is an eyewitness work dating to the 16th century by an orthodox monk who records the massive and atrocious genocidal acts against the Amhara indigenous peoples, by the Oromo and their invasions of different regions. 
The director of archaeological research, Jean Dorres, also relates in his work entitled Ethiopia that the Oromo would sacrifice the Christian Amharas to idols in celebration of their victories of invasion. The Emperor Yasu in one instance would avenge the Amharas which the Boran Oromo had invaded, captured and sacrificed to idols. The Amhara emperors and patriots dedicated their existence to the defense of their kingdom. The highly organized and ruthless invaders would destroy entire cities, massacre the people, loot every treasury and labor to murder the emperor to conquer the kingdom. The emperors and patriots having to defend their nation against invaders, both progressing from the southern borders and Grand Ahmed's African and Arab forces would retaliate at equal intensity. Having eventually regained control, the succeeding generations of invaders would ironically become the accusers of the Amhara, pleading to have been subjugated by them. Very few seem to know that the capital city of Gondor was founded as a fortress city by Emperor Fasiledus to secure the throne of the Emperor of Ethiopia and protect it from the southern invading Oromo by transferring it to the north to Gondor from Shawa. Fasiledus himself was born in Shoa and his father Susnios, who was captured by the Oromo at 16 and lost his father at their hands while at war with them. The heir of the princes known as Zamena Masafant was a hundred years of the nation drowned in utter instability as a result of the constant wars with the expanding Oromos. It is indeed ironic that Amhara patriots are ever painted as subjugators, whereas it is they who have been pushed on their own land and their people who underwent an undiscussed genocide. At last, I will leave you with a quote by Emperor Libna Dingal upon knowing that he had lost every province to the invading enemies and news had reached him of the death of Raswas and Saget, his most important and trusted general, as written in the Futu al Habasha. Libna Dingal said, We shall go to the kingdom of our forefathers, the kings of Amhara. We shall die by the gates of Amhara while defending her.